Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jim Rosenberger, Director of the National Institute of Statistical Sciences, and I'm pleased that NIST can host this 12th scheduled webinar in our joint COPS-NIST series on COVID-19 related data science. COPS is the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies and includes ASA, ENAR, IMS, SSC, and WENAR. I want to thank Professor Shi Hong Lin, Chair of the Organizing Committee, and all who helped organize this series of webinars. And thanks to Glenn Johnson at NIS and Ling Xiao Xu at Penn State and Associate Director at NIS, who provide technical and communication support for this series. Participants are all muted, so we encourage you to put your questions during the discussion into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And, uh, Put them in early because there'll be a lot of time for discussion today. Today's webinar was organized by professors Elizabeth Stewart of Johns Hopkins University and Natalie Dean at the University of Florida, both members of the organizing committee. And the webinar will be moderated by Elizabeth Stewart. Professor Stewart will now introduce our speakers, Professor Jennifer Dowd at the University of Oxford and Ed Young, staff writer for The Atlantic, and moderate the Q&A at the end of the webinar. I now turn the podium over to Professor Stewart. Take it away. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really nice to be back uh, in this series. I think it's been a wonderful opportunity for statisticians and related types to learn about where we are with the pandemic and the statistical issues. And I'm really excited for today's session, which is going to focus on the communication of statistical concepts and epidemiology epidemiologic concepts to broad audiences. And we have two really stellar participants in this. Um, as Jim just mentioned, uh, Jennifer Dowd and Ed Young. The format is gonna be uh, hopefully more interactive and at least sort of more of a discussion among the three of us um, than maybe some of the others in this series. So the, each of the presenters will give, or I, panelists I'll say, will give just a short conversation about kind of their perspective on statistical communication and scientific communication. And then we're gonna use the bulk of the time, hopefully around 40 minutes or so for a sort of Q and A. So I have some questions teed up, but I really encourage you to put questions into the Q and A box and I'll monitor those so we can have some audience engagement in this. Uh, so let me turn to introducing our panelists. Uh, first, Jennifer Dowd uh, has training in demography, economics, and epidemiology, earning a PhD from Princeton, and a, she was then a postdoctoral fellow um, as a Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholar at the University of Michigan. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that program, uh, which is a really wonderful program. Uh, Jen's academic work focuses on the statistical analysis of large data sets to better understand population health and mortality including research on the demography and mortality impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for our relevance today in particular, she is a founding member and chief scientific officer of the social media campaign, Dear Pandemic, AKA those nerdy girls. Uh, and we'll see some examples of their science communication um, in a few minutes. Uh, I'll briefly introduce Ed and then come back to Jen. But uh, Ed is a staff writer at The Atlantic and has focused on the COVID-19 pandemic in his writing in the past year and has received numerous awards over the course of his career, including the George Polk Award for Science Reporting, the Victor Cohen Prize for Medical Science Reporting, Neil and Susan Sheehan Award for Investigative Journalism, the John McGovern Award from the American Medical Writers Association, and a AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Award for in-depth reporting. Uh, so you can see he's very much a great partner for scientists in helping get our ideas out. Uh, prior to joining The Atlantic, Ed's writing was featured in National Geographic, New Yorker, Wired, New York Times, Nature, Scientific American, and other publications. And just two additional final tidbits um, one is that he has, it's not our focus today, but he apparently has a TED talk on mind controlling parasites uh, that has been watched by over 1.5 million people. So um, maybe look that up after if you're curious. And final tidbit is that he has a Chatham Island Black Robin named after him. So again, maybe uh, later if we run out of statistical questions, we can come back to the story behind that. Um, so again, we're gonna, the idea is sort of short seven-ish minute uh, conversations from each of 
Jen and then Ed, uh, and then we'll sort of turn to a moderated Q&A. So please post your questions and uh, I will turn it over to Jennifer Dowd to start us off. All right, can you guys see that? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Um, great, thanks so much, Liz, for the invitation. Um, I bet when you invited me back in the fall, I didn't feel particularly well equipped to talk about science communication. I think like many of us um, in the past year, I've been you know, thrown into things that I'm learning on the fly, um, but I'm really happy to, to be here and to share what I have learned over the past 14 months or so, and especially in the spirit of encouraging more academics, I think to take on this challenge of science communication. Um, I truly believe now that the more clearly we can communicate our research all the time, um, that it will have more impact and also lay the groundwork for better public understanding of key statistical concepts and understanding data uh, when times of crisis like this actually arrive. So I wanted to tell you a bit about our science communication endeavor and how um, I got sucked into this. Um, it, it went back to March of 2020 and a couple of my colleagues, particularly Allison Buttenheim and Malia Jones, founded a Facebook page called Dear Pandemic, uh, which was a riff on Dear Abby. And it really was in the beginning a way to answer questions for desperate family and friends. Um, they quickly recruited a few more of us, um, but we were getting you know, everything. Should I cancel my spring break? Is, is my dog gonna give me COVID? Um, you know, all the questions that we were having at the very beginning. And an early follower commented that they would trust anything those nerdy girls have to say. So that's how our, our nickname was born. And we have quite a multidisciplinary expertise, which I think has really helped throughout the pandemic. We have clinicians, epidemiologists, demographers, immunologists, behavioral scientists, a lot, a lot of PhDs. And the, the campaign really has um, grown a lot over the past year. We have over 100,000 followers on, on different social media. We found out our website is going to be archived by the Library of Congress um, for its pandemic collection. And so we've been building this plane as we're flying it. Um, none of us were particularly trained in science communication, but um, it's really given us um, a purpose and, and a way to, to feel like we're helping um, with all that's been going on. So, um, part of our mission as it evolved um, from the beginning is really to educate and empower people to navigate the overabundance of COVID information. Um, so we know there's a lot of misinformation, but there's also just so much of it um, that I think even academics were having a hard time keeping up. So some, time of, some type of curation and interpretation was really needed. Um, and our goal was to become the trusted source of that type of curation. Um, and so it's not only to empower people um, with accurate information, but we also, as a secondary goal, we're hoping to give people tools, um, you know, to better be able to interpret the science and, and particularly data that was coming out like a fire hose. Um, so those have been two of our, our main goals in the project. And what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, Facebook is still our primary platform is where we were kind of born. Um, and we post a couple times a day on all topics related to COVID. They're, they're kind of like blog posts, um, but they, you know, they run the, the gamut of potential topics, a lot on vaccines, obviously more lately. Uh, we also do Facebook Lives weekly and we have um, a website that, that, is a, um, that holds all of our past posts that you can search easily in newsletter and also a Spanish mirror site called Querida Pandemia. Um, and one of the things that's been really helpful is that we have this bi-directional communication with our audience. Um, so it was set up as a Q&A and we do take questions in a question box and get over 250 questions a week that really help us kind of take the pulse of what, what is on people's minds. And, and that has been a really fascinating experience. And you know, part of what we think has worked in this um, you know, kind of unexpected um, platform that we created is that we are providing information to people in a format that is native to this social media platform. And so sharing the content is really easy. And we think that's been kind of part of the magic of what happened. 
Um, we know that misinformation spreads really quickly on Facebook. Um, but people also do turn to social media for a lot of their health news. So um, in some ways, you know, because we were communicating with family and friends, that's where we started. Um, and it turned out to be a way that people, you know, we could turn some of those weapons of social media back against themselves and give people the ability to share accurate information. Um, and we've also, this last point of the power of personal connection, really tried to capitalize on trust that we've built um, over these many, many months. Um, we try to really lead with our humanity. We, we haven't been very you know, academic about it. We try to be the nerdy moms next door, um, as relatable as we can be. We try to admit when we're wrong or when things have changed. Um, and we've tried to stay as nonpartisan as we can, even though that was a big challenge when um, one certain person was a big source of most of the misinformation. Um, and so we really feel that this, the grassroots nature of, of Dear Pandemic um, has been this personal connection and engendering trust. And um, what we really hope is that the messages that we're able to relay kind of radiate out to, to all of our followers. Um, and so we want all of our readers to be that node and source of good information in their own networks. Um, and so we do kind of talk about the power of the share button that it's you know, different from if we had just set up a website or just um, you know, sent out newsletters from the beginning that people have an easy way to share and they really do so, especially when we're combating some new piece of misinformation or some, some myth. And I just wanted to highlight that um, this one of these quotes here from Fred that I think brings home that point. Um, I think this was a post about vaccines where we did get a little bit technical, um, but Fred wrote, while I don't always understand some of the details, I don't have to understand it all because you people have built a level of trust. And it is this level of trust which helps us feel confident that the vaccines are overwhelmingly safe. Um, and that just meant the world to us um, because we have been, you know, doing this day in, day out. And we realized that, you know, it was an ongoing relationship. And what we did in those early months um, really built up this level of trust that allowed us to communicate about the vaccines. Um, and so that's, that's been something that we didn't really know when we started, but has been um, a really important point. Um, and so next, I wanted to just give you a flavor of what some of the most common topics um, that were asked about and that we deal with. Um, you know, there's been a lot of trying to communicate statistics, but obviously we can't do it in, in a really technical or fancy way. Um, but I wanted to, to talk about some of the things that have come up. Um, one thing is, you know, assessing risk. And so I think that's something that statisticians are all about is, is thinking about things probabilistically. And what we've learned is that people really have a hard time evaluating risk or competing risks. And they often really want us to absolve them of that responsibility. So we get tons of questions about, is it safe to do X, Y, or Z in my particular situation? And so, you know, one simple thing has been to really try to communicate risk as a continuum, that it's not a light switch. People really want it, you know, things to be a light switch in this pandemic, you know, herd immunity, um, or taking masks on and off. So um, that's been a really challenge, you know, a challenging thing to communicate. Um, and I wanted to give one example um, that, that um, I kind of had, uh, you know, a challenging time dealing with in the past couple months. Um, so as vaccines were being deployed, we were really conscious of the potential for um, you know, once we start vaccinating millions of people, there's going to be people um, within a week or so who will die or have a heart attack or some other event. And it will be very easy for the media and social media to pick that up and, and attribute it to the vaccine. So we tried to inoculate our readers a bit by kind of explaining this and, you know, giving them some tools to, to realize that bad stuff happens every day and we don't attribute it to the vaccine. So we have to, you know, look at whether we're seeing things that are happening above and beyond what we would expect, um, you know, normal rates of these things to be. And when the AstraZeneca blood clot news first came out of Europe, um, I kind of came back to this message to our followers and said, you know, it doesn't look like anything to be concerned about. The, the overall level of blood clots was not elevated um, and sort of tried to hammer home this point of, you know, really don't worry. And of course, within a few days, we got more information um, 
um, this, we got more information that, you know, potentially there was this very specific type of, of blood clot um, that did seem to have an elevated signal. And so, um, you know, I was really conscious of having to backtrack a little bit and say, well, there might actually be something here in the data, but here's how we, you know, it's still very rare and here's how we put that risk in context. Um, and this, there were many figures that came out trying to, to put that that risk in context, but I found um, this one was particularly helpful that compared the risk at different ages to um, ICU admissions due to COVID itself. Um, but it was really tricky and I, and I worried a lot about coming back and communicating to our followers that yes, there actually might be something dangerous about, about this particular vaccine. Um, the next kind of uh, very frequent topic we get, I'll go through this very fast, is people really want very specific guidance about their you know, particular situation. They don't seem to be able to generalize very well, especially from something like new CDC guidance about you know, what vaccinated people can do. So we spend a lot of time um, maybe walking people through scenarios, which seems to actually help, um, you know, but again, trying to give them some tools to, to think through um, the continuum of risk and, and how that fits into their daily lives. Um, and finally, we, we do a lot of trying to increase uh, literacy around you know, reading headlines um, and also understanding that science is not a fixed set of facts, that it really is a process. And that's something we've tried to hammer away at over, over the months and really educate people, um, teach people a little bit about research design, um, and it is this hope that we're also giving people tools um, to interpret things better on their own. Um, so just to sum up really quickly, um, things that I've learned, but it'll be really fun to talk about more specific examples, um, is that trust has been something that we didn't anticipate being so important, but it, you know, with all the nuances of, um, and challenges of the data that's come out, I think that's been really important. Um, and we're sort of taking it, you know, meeting people where they are in social media. Um, but we've learned to be specific and practical, which is not something academics are well trained to do. Um, and just make it very plain um, and, and easy for people to interpret. So um, I look forward to, to hearing um, Ed's perspective and talking some more with you all. Oh, and this was my shout out to uh, Good Visualizations as well. This was one of Natalie. Dean's wonderful contributions um, on Twitter, um, explaining you know, what the difference between vaccines that reduce um, disease but not infectiousness versus ones that reduce infectiousness. So um, another a shout out for good visualizations have been really, really key. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and maybe we could uh, put in the chat some of the links. Uh, I can try to do that maybe during the conversation, but thank you, yeah, really inspiring. And we're getting some great, great, great questions already, uh, which we'll come back to, but including things like, I think done for you as sort of an academic, I'm straddling these different worlds. Um, but it's really an impressive effort. I will say I myself have forwarded the Dear Pandemic resources to some friends and colleagues who have these sorts of questions. So I personally have found it useful and I think clearly a lot of other people have too. So kudos to you and the team. I also will add, I got a little note um, that Dr. Dowd is also the incoming editor in chief at Dear Pandemic. So great to see that um, sort of whole enterprise continuing and evolving. Uh, wonderful. So I'm going to turn now to Ed Young and uh, he'll give us uh, the journalist sort of perspective on these topics. Uh, thanks, um, Jen. That was great. Um, what a what an inspiring thing you've done. Um, I I'm going to go into in a slightly different direction. Um, like I've I've been writing about the pandemic for um, for 920 years now, um, and um, through a lot of large pieces for the Atlantic, I've tried to make sense of this um, incredibly uh, vast and complicated and confusing crisis for our readers. And I wanted to talk about, um, I, I've been really interested in trying to work out like why we, um, the US in particular, and I guess the global community at large, have actually been so bad at dealing with um, this crisis. Um, and in terms of communication and in terms of statistical concepts, 
I was thinking about six things that um, have struck me as, as being problems, as impediments to our understanding um, of the pandemic and how people think about um, some of the uh, sources of data and the, the stats they've heard. Um, so, so six things. Um, the first is the illusion of magic numbers. Like throughout the pandemic, we have uh, repeatedly focused on certain um, statistical concepts as if they were like immutable, as if they were some inherent property of the virus um, that, that is unchanging. So I'm talking about things like R0. Um, this is the subject of the first piece I've wrote about the pandemic for the Atlantic. I'm talking about things like case fatality ratios. Um, and now most recently, um, and very prominently herd immunity thresholds. Um, all of these concepts, of course, are changing. Things like R0 and, and CFR depend on um, uh, the society that the, the disease happens to strike at, at, at any given time, like how much, um, uh, to, to what degree COVID is being controlled, to what degree um, people are receiving the treatments that they, um, they should be getting. Uh, all of these, these quantities um, vary. Um, depending on the situations we find ourselves, ourselves in, but they are often treated um, by the media and by our audiences as if they were fixed. And I think that has been a consistent problem in our, in our ability to explain COVID to, um, to um, our audiences. So the second thing is the, uh, related to this, the, the illusion of infallible tests. Um, this idea that as soon as you put a number onto something, and as soon as that number comes from a a test, it like it suddenly gains this um, th this imprimatur, this sense that it is um, absolutely correct. And of course, like people who work um, in in these fields know that that is not true. Like every set, every test, whether diagnostic or otherwise, has sensitivity. It has specificity. It throws up false positives and false negatives. And I think those nuances are often lost in the discourse around the pandemic. Like you, if you get a diagnostic test for COVID, there is the, often this assumption that the results of those tests are correct without asking harder questions about to, to, like, what are the odds of them being correct? And even beyond um, what I've just said, th there, are, there are nuances that I think even experts in the field miss. Like I'm, I'm often struck by how, by how frequently um, even seasoned clinicians and scientists forget about the base rate fallacy, like the idea that um, even like a very accurate test can produce results that are alarmingly inaccurate if they're looking for something that is quite rare in the general population. Um, so just to, as a quick way of explaining that, like say you have a, a test for like antibodies, right? if your test has a sensitivity and specificity of 95%, but you're still only looking for, some, for something that exists in 5% of people, your positives will be wrong half the time. And that's like, I think that's really shocking to a lot of people. And it's deeply counterintuitive to the extent that every time I write or talk about this problem, I inevitably get people, almost always men, writing in, telling me that I've done some sort of miscalculation because it just, it feels wrong. And that's part, I think we'll return to this concept a lot in this discussion that, Often the difficulty in communicating statistical concepts to people is that the, they are counterintuitive. Like what is right often feels wrong. And that can have like really disastrous consequences. Like this isn't just an academic thing. Like I've written ex extensively about um, long haulers. So people who have um, experienced COVID symptoms that don't go away after several months. And many long haulers are in an unenviable situation because they struggle to get tests early on in the pandemic, right? When tests just weren't available. And when they got, by the time they actually got tested, they were so far along into their illness that probably there wasn't any like actually circulating virus left in their system. So obviously their tests were negative, but that has been, for many of them, that's been taken as a sign that they never had COVID in the first place without taking into account the nuances of like, where you are in your in the course of an infection when you get a test. All right, the third thing, um, the illusion of real-time information. Um, I think that because of how easily we can access source of input, sources of information about the world around us, we have this like 
expectation that we will know a lot more about the pandemic very quickly than we actually do. Like I, on my phone here, I can pull up real time weather information, right? I can get exact, I can get pretty accurate predictions of whether it's going to rain in my local area in the next month or so. We can't get that for COVID. We can barely like understand what happened yesterday, right? Like there is there are inevitable lags in our sources of data such that, for example, um, case counts are always lower on weekends because of lags in reporting and the tabulation of data. And yet like even a year into the pandemic, I was seeing reporters saying like, oh, cases are at an all time low. Like it's a Sunday, come on, we've been over this. Um, I've written in the past that pandemic data are like the light of distant stars. They take time to reach us. And so what we see is always a reflection of something that has already taken place and occurred in the past. And we forget that. Similarly, like um, we forget that what we see now is a reflection of like, so my colleague Amanda Mull wrote this great piece about the, the um, pandemic data lag and the problems that, that, that it causes. So, you know, when you see cases rising, that's not because of what happened yesterday. That's the result of like policies that ha and, and behaviors that happened several weeks ago. And the, and like, and the time it then takes for those um, changes um, to lead into actual behaviors that lead to actual infections, that lead to um, diagnostic tests, that lead to those tests, the, the results of those tests being tabulated, that lead to spikes in data that we can then see is huge, right? It, that's at least a couple of weeks and possibly longer. And yet again, repeatedly throughout the pandemic, I saw people treating data as if it was a reflection of what is happening in the moment when it's absolutely not. Um, the, um, this is something that um, Natalie Dean, who I know is watching um, right now uh, and who helped to organize this session, um, made clear to me quite early on. I, I interviewed, um, uh, her for a piece about why the coronavirus is so confusing. And she, she gave me this quote, which, uh, which was really stuck in my head ever since, that I think people underestimate how difficult it is to measure things. And for us who work in public health, measuring things is like 80% of the problem. Um, and we forget that, right? So, so we treat these numbers as if they were like magical quantities that reflect our truth without, under, without grappling with where they come from and the uncertainties in, in obtaining them in the first place. Um, the fourth thing is the, the, I don't even know how to describe it, like the illusion that the ecological fallacy is not actually a fallacy. Right? So um, the ecological fallacy is the idea that we look at um, comparison across large populations and treat those differences as if they reflected individuals within those populations. Right? So one very common thing that people have done throughout the pandemic is to look at two different countries that say have very big differences in their rates of infections or deaths and to try and explain that or to use that as an or to like come up with some explanation right to say like country a wore masks and have much look has much lower rates of covid than country b therefore masks work and masks are great but that's not a great rationale for why masks are great like that we we know that um, different, large, uh, different groups like countries that have large populations have huge variations within those populations and therefore like a huge number of reasons why there could be very um, um, differences um, between those groups. Um, and yet I think that um, those kinds of large scale comparisons, especially at the national level, are very compelling to people. I think they make or strong narratives. And I think that it's it's almost like an inverse of like the, the how strong the evidence at the, those um, comparisons provide is versus how strong they feel. Like again, it's this this, like, this discrepancy between um, like how whether explanations feel right or whether they are right. Um, related to this, we know that um, uh, the pandemic develops in exponential ways and exponential growth is really hard for people to, to understand and to, to intuit. You know, there's that old riddle about lily pads and a pond. Um, you know, the, the pond is covered on day 47. At what point is the pond half covered? It's day 46, right? Because of exponential growth. But 
that's not what that it's that's a very difficult concept for people to get their heads across and that costs lives in the pandemic because we see trajectories going up people who understand how exponential growth works think that things are looking really bad and people who expect more linear trajectories think things are probably kind of fine um with covid it gets even more complicated because of over dispersion because we know that um that um it's not the case that say um, the transmission of infections is evenly spread across the entire population of people who are infected. Um, and that, that, that property um, makes it again, even more difficult to do the kinds of um, uh, like, uh, to, to actually work out what is happening, right? Like why did this community get hit really badly and this one didn't? Why did this country do well and this one didn't? Um, all of these questions are very difficult to um, to answer, especially when you take into account over dispersion, especially when you take into account the pandemic is really wide. Like when you get a big, big event, um, you get more room for just plain stochasticity where like just random shit happens because it's random. And that's sort of my final point, right? Like the 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 longer the pandemic continues and the wider it gets, the weirder it gets. Um, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger the pandemic, um, the bigger the pandemic gets and the more people are infected, the more you see rare events becoming actually quite common. And that creates this bizarre mystique around COVID that it feels like this strange disease that is behaving in these ways that no one has ever seen before. Like we saw this with the sheer variety of symptoms um, uh, that, that COVID entails. We saw this with discussions around long borders and then long COVID. Um, a lot of these phenomena are part and parcel of infectious diseases. We just don't really see, talk about them very often because we don't usually have a completely novel virus to which the world is largely immunologically naive hitting the entire world in a matter of months. Um, so, you know, with, with the pandemic, the denominator always matters, and we sometimes forget that, right? Like, you, when, when you talk about rare events, like, over what, like, over what um, uh, total number of people is that occurring? But the numerator matters, too, and we sometimes forget that, too. Like, in, in trying to provide context for some of the stats, there's almost, like, an act of dismissal that happens, right? Like, a, a, an, a one in a thousand event that affects a million people is still gonna affect a thousand people. And those incidents matter. Like when we're talking about rare symptoms, when we're talking about, uh, I don't know, reinfections or, or many of the other issues that raise the head over the course of the pandemic. Um, both, of these, both of these things matter, the, denom the, den the denominator and the numerator. We need to think about both of those together. Um, that's all I wanted to say. I'm sure we can talk about um, a lot of these things in more depth during the Q&A, but these are six of the issues that have been on my mind and have perpetually vexed me as I've been trying to cover the pandemic over the last year and a bit. Great, thank you. Uh, you can see that why you've been so successful as a journalist is the sort of thoughtfulness and care that you approach this and sort of deep understanding of the issues underlying. Um, so I had laid out some questions in advance, but we're getting some really great questions in the chat to, or in the Q&A as well. So I'm going to um, mix things up a little bit in the order. I'm just warning Ed and <laughs> Jen that we're not, I'm not going to go in the order I told them I was going to go in. Um, and I want to start with perhaps one of the hardest questions. And I think I'll have Jen answer this one first. Um, and it, you know, I had sort of been thinking about it myself as a statistician, we are often taught to be sort of skeptical and to sort of really probe study designs and to think really carefully about the limitations of a study. And this is true for researchers in general. We're, we're very well trained to write that limitation section of a paper. Um, but then how do you sort of think about that when you're trying to communicate ideas to a broader audience? And sort of how do you think through this sort of balance of, well, maybe it's not the definitive study or maybe has limitations, but it still gives us information. Um, and I'm part, I'm jumping to this one. I'll just read Megan Fitzpatrick wrote in a question. 
which is I think related, which is to what extent should scientists try to explain the technical reasoning to reporters or I'd say to sort of the public versus repeating the big picture message to make sure the main point gets across. So again, just this tension of sort of balancing the scientific content with how much of the sort of behind the scenes, how much do we trust it, um, how much of that to convey. So Jen, I'll turn to you and see if you have any insights on that. Yeah, that's the really easy question, right? Um, no, I, I think we have really struggled with that because you're right. I mean, we spend you know years in seminars nitpicking these types of study designs and that just does not fly on Facebook. So I think part of what we really tried to do um, was again, emphasized from the beginning that science was a process um, and that things might change and that that was actually a good thing. So we tried to at least lay the groundwork um, for there being some limitations. Um, we did try to emphasize study designs from the beginning, especially with the trials um, and explaining, you know, when we had more confidence. Um, I don't know, we, yeah, we have some acronyms that we laid out um, to try to get people to understand, is there a comparison group? You know, what's the context? Um, you know, could this have happened by chance? So we, um, we do lay out limitations, but I think you're right. We do feel pressure at the end of the day to give people a bottom line. And so I have gotten much more confident in saying, you know, the jury's still out, but the best evidence we have right now is that the vaccines lower transmission. And um, even though I'm not, completely confident with all the observational data that's coming out on that. I do think we owe it to people to make a call. So I've become much more comfortable doing that for better or for worse. <laughs> Great, Ed, anything you would wanna add from your perspective as you kind of try to make sense of the scientific literature? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, the I, to me, um, uncertainty um, isn't, I don't think it's a bug, right? I, I think it's um, I think it's something that we can actually run towards. I, I don't I don't see it as a threat. Like it makes the job harder, but it's um, I think if I think we ignore it at, at our peril, and I think we actually need like the core of this job about doing good science journalism is actually like laying clear, making clear the extent of uncertainty, the the reasons for it, the sources of it. And I think also like how how it might be resolved. Like I've tried to, um, in my pieces, make clear like what we know and what we don't know, but also like why we don't know. Right? Like, why does uncertainty exist, and how might it how might it change? Like I I wrote a piece um, in um, in May uh, about. Um, what at the time was, um, I think, a, a big overblown story about um, uh, about um, new, like new, highly transmissible COVID strains. Um, and it's interesting looking back on that now, like given that variants are genuinely a problem, and you know, increased transmissibility, transmissibility is very much a problem. But like, I don't think that I wrote that piece to say like variants aren't a problem, right? There's no, there's no message there. Um, I wrote it to say like, okay, a lot of people I've spoken to don't feel that like these claims are, 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 uh, that are circulating right now um, hold up. Here is why they think that. Here are the types of evidence that it would take to change their minds. And here is how we might get that evidence and the time frame that you could expect clearer answers in. And that's what I like. That's one of the things I've tried to do throughout. Like when I interview people, I often ask uh, um, some of the, the questions I ask often include things like um, on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you about that? Like, how do you how do you know what you just told me? And like, what would like if you are really confident about that, like, what would it take to change your mind? Um, the, these are these are ways I think in which we can engage um, with the actual process of science, like the stumbling uncertainty of it, um, and make it plain to people. And, and I think that one thing that's really, really important is to, um, is to show you're working, right? Like rather than to, to think about messaging um, or to fixate on like what the answer is, to actually show how you think 
through the problem and how you arrive at that answer. And I think that's something that Jen has already been talking about, right? It's not just like, um, it, you know, the, the work that Dear Pandemic has been doing is not just like, um, you know, here, like, here is what you should do. It's helping people like work out what to do. And, and often like it, through, the, through the medium of answering, like, here's how I'm thinking about what I might do. Um, a lot of people on, uh, a lot of scientists and epidemiologists on Twitter have been really good at this. So, um, so uh, Natalie Dean, who I've already talked about, has been great at this. Uh, Alan Murray has been great at this. Um, like the, the whole, um, all of the th like think like an epidemiologist um, Twitter threads have been, have been wonderful at doing exactly this, like helping people work through the problem so that they can understand how to think through these issues in the, in the style of um, someone with expertise. And I think that's great, not just in addressing like current questions or, um, or like, you know, fighting against the misinformation of the day, but actually in arming people with the tools they need to make sense of things in the future. Like in some ways it's, it's like an, a vaccination against future misinformation. That's great. And that really resonates and actually is a really nice segue to the next topic I want to get to. Um, I'll just quickly read a comment that we got from Jeff Morris, who is saying, Ed, your approach during interviews that gets at the uncertainty and level of evidence is a great one and we need more people to do. So just kudos uh, and appreciation for that. Um, and so one of the themes from what you both talked about that I heard was the need to educate people and not educate them just on this is the transmittability of COVID, or this is kind of where we think the pandemic is, but on these more fundamental concepts of science and how do we do science and what do, what do different statistical concepts mean? So I wanted to, so it's a perfect segue to the next couple of questions I wanted to ask, which is about education and training. Um, and I want to approach it in two ways, just to kind of give you a little intel. Um, I wanted to talk about statistical literacy training sort of for the general public um, and thinking, and Robbie uh, Wido put in a chat sort of on a question on this sort of related to the role of statistics in sort of like middle and high school statistical training right. in like middle and high schools. Um, so I wanna sort of go to there and so we'll cover that first, but just as a heads up, then my second question after that is gonna be training for statisticians and sort of what do you see as sort of the, the needs to train statisticians or how we can become better at these communication aspects. But let's first tackle the first one. So um, kind of maybe I'll go Jen first again, kind of comment on what you've learned about the need or opportunities for kind of statistics education uh, for kind of whether it's kids or adults or whoever. Right. Um, no, this it's interesting because this is definitely the direction I think um, our dear pandemic endeavor wants to go in the future is, um, you know, to become a broader educational campaign. And um, but it's not something that I focused on before, as I said, sort of the pedagogy of, of statistics in a general um, population, I taught, you know, I teach statistics at the master's level. And this really has made me think a lot more about um, the need for that. And um, I think something Ed said really struck me about how a lot of these things that seem counterintuitive are the real challenge where we have to explain things that don't make sense. And the ecological fallacies you mentioned have just, I'm sure they've rubbed us all the wrong way this, this year. Um, and it reminds me that we've we've been getting new questions about the Florida and California contrast and how do you explain that? And it's exactly that type of thing, fighting against that intuition that, that you wanna compare um, two things. And so um, I think that a lot, a lot of our pieces, in some ways I feel like you need to speak very plainly, but you also do not need to necessarily dumb things down. I think when you do explain research design, um, so, you know, Liz, and talking about school reopenings, there's been so much debate about it and, you know, a lot of bad studies and, and some good ones, but I think people really can um, grasp the basic um, elements of study design and that we have to compare apples to apples and Florida and California have a lot of other things that are different about them. So I do have faith that we can instill some of those, that common, that most important intuition. Um, 
And as you kind of led us to led us to think about, I think statistics education is much more important in high school than probably calculus. So I would be happy to to lobby for that. And I think if anything, COVID has really shown us that you know people will be analyzing statistics in their basement. So we better we better give them some tools. Um, to do it sensibly. Um, so it's just to say, there's but you know there's lots of experts on actually how to how to um, communicate data, and I'm I'm eager to learn more of those those tools. But um, I think I think it it can be done. I think there's a lot of basic intuition that we can convey. Thanks, and yeah, I think you're preaching to the choir with this audience of uh, you know advocating for statistics training. Oh, sorry, my. Well, phone ringing right at the wrong time. Uh, statistics training, um, sort of at, at lower levels of education. Ed, uh, Ed, anything you want to add on that? Um, I guess I would say that this is this isn't my area of expertise. I, I'm not an educator. I, I don't, you know, I have no sense of certainly what the American system is like. Um, you don't do statistics, really. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, um, but. I, I do think that um, I do think that this is a recurring theme I have seen in issues of science communication that a lot of people always take it to the the um, educational level and with this idea that like if you provide these foundations it will sort of fix a lot of the problems that we see overlying them and I I guess I have some doubts about like that theory of change um, I, I don't think it's wrong but I, I'm just a little suspicious of like the the um like whether like uh how big a, a part of the solution it, it plays and and i think that because look i did statistics at, at school but um i don't think anything that i learned there in the sort of dim haze of time was massively useful to me in the last year or so um i think a lot of the things that i um a lot of things that i've talked about um either came across through just a, like a lot of reporting, like talking to people and, uh, and asking questions, or have been hard won through like, you know, I think 16 years of being a science journalist now. Like I know about the base rate fallacy and the ecological fallacy because I have committed them and then, and then learn from that mistake. Uh, and I think there is, a, there is an element sort of of learning from the job that everyone's had to do this year. Um, and I think that I, I, I saw I'm inclined to believe that that is more valuable, but also very perilous, right? I, I don't know how you deal with the fact that, like people who are doing wrong statistical calculations in their basement using pandemic data, that, like, I don't think you can educate your way out of that problem, right? Like that stems from things like overconfidence and arrogance. That's, and then it also stems from things like uncertainty. Like people just don't know what to make of the world. And they and doing um, like doing some wrong-headed Excel spreadsheet in their spare time does give them a sense of agency. You know, I don't I think we should I don't think we should frown on that. I think we should just sort of try and steer it in like more productive directions. Great, thank you. Um, so let's turn to the, what what would you want statisticians to learn? Um, and so you could frame this one of two ways. Um, one is sort of just thinking about how do we, well, I will just speak, you know, I don't, I think most statistics programs, whether master's or PhD, don't include, say, training and communications. Um, so kind of, should they? Um, but then also, I guess, from your experience, and maybe this one, Ed, I'll start with you, um, curious from you, like, what are the biggest things statisticians get wrong when talking to the media or sort of lessons that you would, if there's any tips or strategies you might give, you know, so again, both sort of on training of statisticians, but then also what advice would you give for what to, for, to us for what we should or shouldn't do? Yeah, I am. Um, it, it's, it's a slightly hard question to answer, I think, because the, the media is so varied um, and, and I, I often find that if I'm answering this question like in ways that are helpful to me, that doesn't necessarily help people talking to like a lot of reporters, right? There's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's sort of like, there are, there are like, there's, there's an offense and a defense element to this question. Um, I will say that it is 
very, very useful to learn um, upfront like potential pitfalls. So one of the questions I often ask people um, is what are the things that journalists get wrong about this? Um, and that that's very, very helpful to know because um, the interview process for me, for me is not just about filling in the gaps in my knowledge, but also working out what the limits of that knowledge are. Like, so if I can't, like, if I can't delimit the boundaries, then, then I'm much more likely to stray into, like, just stumble into something that's wrong without knowing it. Um, so actually, like, knowing, knowing common pitfalls is really helpful. And actually, and people, like, volunteering that information is always helpful to me. Um, uh, I'm not really sure what else I can I can say about this because I think like you know, to an extent it's a problem with the journalists right like it's our responsibility to try and get that information um, and it, and our failure to to get it is to to me less of a reflection of what like our sources are doing right or wrong and, and more of like our own like professional responsibilities and conduct but I can give it some more thought while Jen's answering and, and <laughs> no that's I, I guess I'll uh intervene for one second and say it seems like one lesson from what you're saying is kind of get to know the journalist you're talking to in a sense and sort of understand um, that they might have different sort of perspectives or just have different they might be coming in with different levels of information and knowledge and that sort of figuring out how to communicate in a way that's going to be useful for what they are trying to accomplish and what they sort of are tracking sure. um, and sort of not necessarily not treating every journalist sort of the same but kind of developing that understanding of Right, and I think you can get a sense of like who they are through their work, right? And so I, um, before I was ever a journalist, I was a spokesperson at a cancer charity working in an information department. So I did like hundreds of interviews with journalists before I ever thought about being one myself. So I appreciate this, this question on a very like, visceral level. And I think what, and, and I, I think you're right that like, you, not every journalist is the same. You can get a sense of who they are through their work and you can treat an interview differently accordingly. Like, you know, you might choose to be more open with some, depending on the questions you get. You might choose to be a little bit more guarded and defensive um, and like careful in what you say. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a, it, you know, just like you wouldn't, you wouldn't approach every conversation with a random person in the same way. You wouldn't approach every interview in the same way. Yeah, and I'll just comment again, Jen, I'll let you, I'll turn to you in a second. Um, I know at least at Hopkins, we're very lucky to have a great communication, media and communications team, and they also can help with this kind of, mm -hmm. they sort of often funnel the media requests. And so you can, you know, for the people listening, you know, you might have people at your institution who can sort of help you figure, figure that out and make sense of it all. So Jen, anything you'd want to add about kind of how we as statistician types uh, can learn how to do this or what we should do differently? Yeah, I can definitely speak to what, what I've learned um, and not so much about talking to the media, but if you want to write for a more general audience, whether that is in a newsletter or a blog or um, you know, writing special pieces and op-eds, um, what the real learning curve for me was learning to write just plainly and without jargon. It really truly is the opposite of what we train ourselves to do, unfortunately, in academia. And so you know, but it's it's magic once you learn how to do it. Um, beautiful writing, like Ed does, is is another level. But you know, just you know, stripping it down and pretend that you are explaining something to a family member or you know a grandmother. Um, I think we all have someone different in mind when we're writing for Facebook, but it really is a very different style. But it it requires a clarity of thinking, and I think distilling things like research design. Um, or the importance of denominators down to, to the basic essence um, does take some practice, but it's, it's really worthwhile, um, again, to just to learn to, to, to write plainly. And, um, and I'll give another pitch, I think, for thinking of creative metaphors and, and visualizations. Um, yes, the way Natalie Dean has done so well on Twitter. Um, you know, we don't always make the most intuitive figures in our academic uh, papers, but this has made me think a lot more about visual communication as well. So, yeah, I think imagine a different audience and it, it naturally um, provides some clarity to your thinking. Mm 
Thanks. And one, um, you know, I guess translating that for the audience we have, you know, I might sort of put out there to masters and PhD program directors who might be on this call or just faculty in general, think about doing some assignments that kind of get students to not write just a research paper, but also, you know, maybe have an assignment that includes that sort of broader communication and figures and things. I think there are like just getting that practice can make a big difference. So uh, we have four minutes left, so we're almost out of time, um, but I wanna give each of you a chance, you know, a minute to give any final thoughts you have, anything that you didn't have time to cover. There were some great questions that came in in the Q&A that we won't have time to get to, but um, maybe in your last minute, you can, <laughs> maybe you'll answer one of them magically. So uh, Ed, I'll go to you first and just see if you have any final thoughts. Yeah, um, um, I think what I'll say is, I, I know that um, some of the questions we've had focus on uh, have asked about like, trust um, in, in science from the public. This is something that like always gets asked. I, I will say that I think that a lot of people think about this problem in the in the wrong way. Like I think actually um, trust in scientists as a class of professionals is extraordinarily high and very stably high across the years. But we have empirical evidence to show this. Trust in journalists, by contrast, is extremely low and always is. Um, so you actually have a tremendous amount of trust from the public. Now, we should, like that may be hard for a lot of people to hear, given after the last year, like, you know, a lot of you may have had like angry emails. You know, it may seem like there is a massive collapse in um, people's respect for public health and institutions. But I think that it's complicated, right? Like people's uh, people's views on the messages that they hear from um, from epidemiologists and statisticians and all the rest are also filtered through their own values, their communities, their identities, their political or religious or, or whatever beliefs. Um, and that's going to affect how they feel about what they hear from you. That doesn't necessarily imply like an implosion of trust, nor does like the fact that it might then there may be like political shenanigans going on, right? Like what, how um, how we think about how science influences policy is a very different question than how we think about how science influences um, people, like how they make sense of a crisis like COVID. I would just encourage everyone to, when thinking about this, that um, there is a substantial literature on the um, science of science communication, on how people make sense of crises, on how, on the power of things like storytelling and communication and, and, all, and all the rest. So they, these are literatures that you should be aware of, because I think that often the, the, like the mental model that a lot of scientists have who don't have experience in this is too simplistic. Like you sort of think that people are empty vessels and you pour in information and they change, they, you know, their minds change and they, they sort of walk away with a, like profound respect for science or whatever. Like it, it's more complicated than that. And, and we have a lot of um, work from the psychological and social sciences to show how complicated it actually is. I would encourage everyone to engage with that. And like Jen has talked a lot about this in, in, her, um, in her opening remarks about the importance of trust about um, establishing trust within the communities that she's talking to, um, you know, such that by the time you start answering questions about like vaccines and personal risk, you, you aren't just some random face, you're a person that these people feel that they can rely on. And that's so important. Like often when we talk about trust in science or trust in, um, you know, or trust in general, the question is always like, how can we get untrusting people to trust us more and less, and whereas maybe it should be, how can we make ourselves more trustworthy to people? Um, that's all I have to say. Um, I'll turn to Jen. I, I, this is great because uh, David Spiegelhalter was, I think the most, was the previous seminar and that was the theme of his talk was, it shouldn't, it's not so much about trust, but about being trustworthy. Uh, and he had so really uh, same, same message you're giving, which is great. So Jen, I'll give you the last word if you have Yeah, I love that. that. Um, that's really hard to top, but I guess I would just encourage people as, as an academic who came into this fray, I mean, so many academics did, um, you know, come in to do very different things during the pandemic, but um, I want to encourage people to, to not assume that this is not your lane, that you don't have things to contribute to public discourse, because I think, 
Um, you know, there were so many different disciplines have been vital to understanding the pandemic. And I think that will be true in any global crisis that we have. So, you know, there's a little bit of Twitter back and forth about you shouldn't comment on this outside of your discipline. But, you know, especially for statisticians or in my field, kind of population scientists, there was a lot to contribute and, um, you know, that, that you weren't going to get from necessarily clinical or lab based sciences. And so, I would just encourage you, if you feel like it's a little outside of your comfort zone, um, you still have a lot to contribute. And exactly, it's it's not about um, you know the role of scientists um, distant from the community. We have to find a way to get that information um, pipeline going in a way that's more trustworthy. So I do think scientists are respected, but we don't usually think about how to translate our work you know, at all. Um, and in a crisis, it just became um, a real emergency you had to figure out how to get that information out. So um, yeah, just I, I think it really is worth investing in some of these skills as Liz suggested, and don't be afraid to do things that feel really awkward at first. Great advice. Uh, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you. This has been incredibly inspiring and uh, I hope that the, I'm sure the attendees learned a lot. I really appreciate both of you taking the time to share your insights and wisdom. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and thanks so much.